all. We were in the book of Hebrews. That's right. We were in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. Hebrews. And I believe the chapter was what? The chapter is 9. And the verse is... All righty now. You, that's it. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9 and the verse is 11. And I assure you uh, that I shall um, be long. Now, uh, there we are. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. I'm going to emphasize just a few things. And then I'm going to uh, give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. If you need uh, to say yes uh, to Jesus. Verse uh, number 11. And we read down through verse number what? There you go. Verse number 14. All right. Now, we're going to begin reading in verse 11, and we're going to read down through verse 14. All right, let's read. Read. But Christ, being come, a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Look at your neighbor and say, no, no. I, know I know it was the blood. All right, you may have to see. That's for sure. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. Now, what I did this morning, I mean, what I did this afternoon, I went home this afternoon and wrote some notes. Uh, thank you, Brother Carter. I went home and wrote some notes and um, but to give you some scriptures because I didn't, I, I didn't give you all the scriptures that I had planned to give you. I quoted a lot of stuff, but uh, I want to do it uh, uh, chronologically and, and sequentially so you'll have that if you're interested in it. I know it was the blood, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, and you understand we read verse 11 through verse number 14. And then I said, Jesus is our Passover. I don't even know that I gave you the scripture. Jesus is our Passover. I don't know that I gave you the scripture this morning, but there it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7. Let's read that though. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7. Uh, where did it go? Uh, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse number 7. Uh, oh, you're going to put that up there. Okay. Uh, well, how are you going to do it? 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7. <laughs> All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7. All right, Brother Hutchison. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7, the Bible says, Purge out therefore the old leaven. Purge out therefore the old leaven. That ye may be a new lump. That you might be a new lump. As ye are the unleavened. Yes. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. There it is. Christ is our Passover that was sacrificed for us. Now here is what I need you to get. And I think if you get the picture... If you get the picture, I'll be finished. Um, I, I just need you to get the picture. Now, uh, understand that during the journeys of the Hebrews, and I want to make this clear, during the journeys of the Hebrews from Abraham to Christ, uh, from Genesis 12 to Matthew 1, um, God's people journeyed from uh, Egyptian bondage, beginning with Exodus chapter 12, and they, they made their way toward Canaan's land. And, of course, they came up against all kinds of difficulties uh, because they had to meet the Gorgosites, the Jezbeosites, and the Amorites, and all those Ikes. And, of course, God told them, don't marry these people, don't get involved with these people, just keep your focus, keep moving, keep going where I tell you to go, I'm going to fight your battle, 
and, uh, and you will get to the promised land. We understand they didn't do that, of course, but that's what God encouraged uh, them uh, to do. And in that sojourn, in that sojourn from Egyptian bondage to the promised land, God gave them instruction. He gave them instruction to build a tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle, the tabernacle was portable. They could carry the thing. Um, now, the, the, that is a replica of it. When they, when they was traveling, they carried a replica of the, of the tabernacle. Um, now, the tabernacle was for the purpose of uh, God's purpose for dwelling with Israel because God dwelt in the tabernacle. God dwelt in the most holy place. That's where he dwelt. The tabernacle had a court. The tabernacle had uh, two rooms. One was the holy place and the other was the most holy place. Now, everybody, when they came for the Day of Atonement, when they came for the Day of Atonement, everybody gathered in the courtyard. They could not go in the holy place. They could not go into the most holy place. Now, every day, the priest, the priest went into the holy place to pray for the people. They had daily sacrifices, and the priests went into the holy place every day to pray for the people. But once a year, the Day of Atonement, once a year, the high priest, and that's a different person than just the regular priest, the high priest, he was the one that went into the most holy place. He was the only one that was authorized to go behind that veil and operate and to offer sacrifices in the most holy place. Only the high priest was allowed to do that. And that was done once a year. But now here's what you got to understand. And, I'm, and I want you to get this picture. I'll read some for you. But the courtyard, everybody could come to the courtyard. Everybody could come to the courtyard. But everybody couldn't go in the holy place or the most holy place. All right, now, uh, in the courtyard, sacrifices were made. That's where they would build the altar and they would take the bullock or the ram or the goat or the lamb and they would kill it. And they would put him on the altar. The lamb had to be a perfect lamb. He, as I told you this morning, the ram and the bullock had to be perfect. They had to take him out from the rest of the stock and they had to put him up for 14 days for the purpose of checking to see whether or not he was perfect. To see whether or not he was crippled. To see whether or not he had a disease. To see whether there were any blemishes on him. And it took them 14 days to check that sacrificial animal. And if there were any blemishes, if there were any broken bones, then the rabbis rejected him. Now, here's what I also need you to see. The lamb, the perfect lamb, represented Jesus Christ. The perfect lamb represented Jesus Christ. Not a bone in the body of that lamb was to be broken. And you remember on the cross, uh, when, they, when the soldiers came to hasten on death, they break the legs of the thieves. But when they came to Jesus, he was already there. For as the scripture said, not a bone in his body should be broken. So now, Jesus represents the sacrificial 
lamb. Now, we have the high priest. The high priest has to go into the most holy place to pray for the people at the mercy seat because that's where God is. The, the, the presence of God is in the most holy place and is at the mercy seat. So now, the high priest has got to get the blood from the sacrificial lamb and he's got to take that blood into the most holy place at the mercy seat because that's where the presence of God is. And he's going to have to sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat and he's going to have to do it seven times. Now, Jesus talks about the, uh, of the Hebrew writer talks about the heavenly tabernacle. Now this earthly tabernacle is a replica of the heavenly tabernacle. What God is instructing Moses to build is a replica of what's already in heaven. And not only that, but what is being done here is going to be done by Jesus Christ when he comes. But watch this. Jesus came as the Lamb of God. Remember, jo remember John said in John 1 29, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. All right, now, here is a unique thing about this. Jesus is the Lamb that's going to be killed. He is also the high priest. So, when Jesus, when the high priest comes to the tabernacle, he's got, I started to tell you this this morning, and I just gave you a, picture, a small snippet of it. The high priest has to take off his regular clothes and put on divine clothes that were stipulated by God. Now watch Jesus. When Jesus came, he had to take off his garment of divinity and put on a fleshly garment. And he became a man just like we are. So just like the high priest had to take off his garment, Jesus took off his garment, which was divinity, because he was both God and man. So once he takes off his fleshly garment, the high priest, then he goes over and he kills the lamb. Now the unique thing about this is, Jesus is the lamb, and he is the high priest. So then, when he comes to earth, he takes off his divinity and puts on mortality. And then he gets on the altar. Boy, this is something. He gets on the altar and becomes the lamb. And then he has to get off the altar and become the hot. Y'all ain't seeing this. He has to get off the altar and become the high priest. And then he has to take his own blood. <laughs> because the high priest can't get into that tabernacle without blood. And, and so uh, in order for us to be redeemed, we have to be redeemed by the blood of Christ. So which means then Christ has to die. So when Christ died, his side was open, the blood came off. Jesus had to take his own blood. He had to be the high priest. He had to be the lamb. He had to shed his own blood. Then he had to take his own blood into the most holy place in order that we might have redemption. Very powerful. And it really just shows us how much the Lord loved us. Now let, let me take you quickly to Leviticus, the 16th chapter. The 16th chapter of the book of Leviticus, I want to show you something. Uh, we was in Exodus 14. Let's go to Exodus 14 first. Exodus 14 first. Because that's uh, where we find out 
of this whole business about the, the Passover land is in the 12th chapter of the book of Exodus. When we read the 12th chapter of the book of Exodus, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. In other words, God is saying that this Passover has to happen on a certain day. It can't happen any day you want it to happen. It has to happen on a certain day. If you want me to forgive your sins, if you want me to reconcile you to me and, and uh, the flesh to the spirit, then you have to do this on a certain day. You can't do it any other day except the day that the Lord authorizes. Which means then that whatever day the Lord authorizes, that's the day that Christian must worship the Lord like he says and on no other day. And then he says, now that's going to be the first of the month. And then he says uh, in verse uh, um, verse number three that it must be done on the tenth day and then he says your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year and you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day I'm reading verse six the fourteenth day of the same month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening now of course I talked about that this morning Jesus died in the evening between 12 and 3 o'clock in the evening when he hung on the cross. It only goes to show that he is the Lamb. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Now watch this. Take the blood, watch the instruction, take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post. You got to put the blood in the right place. Now you can't, just, you can't put the blood on the roof of the house. You got to put it in the right place. And not only put it uh, in the right place, but when the blood is shed, when it is shed, now listen, the lamb or the bullock or the lamb or the goat, they, while they lived, they lived because of the blood in their bodies. Now, if they had killed a lamb on the eighth month and on the ninth day they put some blood on the side post, it wouldn't have helped them at all. They had to do it at the direction of the Father. Now put it on the two door post and the upper door post. That's where is going to have its effect. You put it anywhere else, it's not going to have its effect. Now watch this. If Christ had been going in the temple one day, and if Christ had scratched his arm on the door, on the wall, and some blood came out, that would not have been the blood to cleanse us from our sin. Even though it was the blood of Christ. But it wasn't shed, y'all not getting this. It wasn't shed at the right time. The only way the blood of Christ has efficaciousness is it was shed on the top of Mount Calvary on the old rugged cross. If, listen, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says that when he prayed, the sweat was as great drops of blood. But that's not the blood. 
You got what I'm saying? That's not the blood that's going to cleanse us. He's got to shed that blood on the cross. If he sheds it anywhere else, it's not going to work. And so, uh, when he said put it on the doorpost, that simply meant that you had to put it in the right place. And Christ's blood becomes efficacious when it was shed on the cross. And if it was shed anywhere else, at any other time, it would not have the effect of reconciling man to God. And then the Bible says, shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood, and strike it on the two side posts, reading verse 7, and on the upper door posts of the house, wherein they shall eat it. They shall eat it. Now, and they shall eat the flesh in that night. Now listen, that's talking about Christ. Now, John chapter 6, verse 63. Now, my man, <laughs> my man Raymond, he quotes it every time he does the communion. Except to eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And we've been quoting that. He knows it. He's been quoting that for 20 some years. Maybe longer than that. But that's not what that's talking about. And I never told him that. I never told him because it, it, it doesn't mean he ain't going to hit him because he's quoting that. Doesn't mean that at all. Or when we quote that, or if any other body, if any if any person quote that. When he said, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood you have no life in you. That does not refer to the communion. That has no reference at all to the communion. But that is said, see Jesus said, if you read chapter 6, he says, I am the bread of life. And if any man eat my flesh and drink my blood, has life. So what he's talking about is he's talking about the fact that he is saying that you must believe in me. And then he makes the comparison between the manna that fell down from heaven for the forefathers of these Jews. And he said, your forefathers ate that manna, but they still got hungry. He said, but if any man eat the bread that I shall give him. Same thing in, in, in John chapter 4, when Jesus came to that woman at the well. He said, the water I'm going to give you is living water. You see, which means that's a metaphor for something else. And, and so, uh, in John chapter 6, he is talking about believing in me. Let's go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Now, the reason I got to that is because of the fact uh, uh, when they take this blood and put it on the doorpost, the Bible says they're then supposed, they're then supposed to be. But in John chapter number 6, John chapter number 6, John chapter number 6, yeah, verse number 48. The Bible says, if, if you're looking at it, John 6, 48, Jesus says, I am what? I am that bread of life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven. He's talking about himself. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread. He's talking about living bread. He's talking about the living word. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. Now that's his word. That's Jesus himself. When we ex Jesus is, doing, is giving us a metaphor by saying that uh, if you eat carnal bread, you will die. But if you eat the bread that I give you, you will live. In other words, if you accept me as your personal savior, and if you accept my word that I give you, you will live. Not only in this life, but in the life to come. That's what the Lord is talking about there. Now that doesn't have. You see, 
Uh, I said that because I had to say that because I was explaining that. But uh, when we quote that as uh, when we quote that uh, at the Lord's table, that don't mean it, it's it's okay because I, the reference is the reference is to the Lord's Supper. That's what the reference is to. When we quote it, we quote it because we are referring to the Lord's Supper. What I am saying to you is that's not the interpretation of the verse. The verse is not talking about the Lord's Supper. The verse is talking about accepting Jesus, believing on Jesus, and taking him at his word. Now the Lord's Supper is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And verse, but you know what that is. First Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23. For I have received the Lord, which also I deliver unto you. The same night the Lord. And we know that's what that is. But now John 6, 63, 48, right on down through verse number 66. That's talking about believing in Jesus. When he said, eat my flesh, drink my blood, he's talking about believe on me. Take what I say. Obey my word. And if you obey my word, you will live eternally. That's what it is. Now that's the interpretation of the verse. But now, that doesn't mean that Raymond didn't know what he was talking about. Because I've never said anything to him. Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because I know what he, not only him, but anybody else. I, I know what my brothers are doing. They are referring to the Lord's Supper. And, and, and it just and that verse just fits. It just fits when you talk about the Lord's Supper. But hermeneutically, that's not what the text is saying. Are you following what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm not just beating Raymond over the head because he's sitting there. I'm just simply saying that that's not what the text is saying. And the reason I went there is because these people in Egypt, not only did they have to put the blood in the right place but then they had to eat the blood. You see? And, 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 and here's what's going on. Here's, here, here was another thing we do understand uh, about that. When Jesus see, when you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, that means that you are taking him totally. You are taking everything. His flesh and his blood. And that's what Paul was saying when he said, whatever you do, and words are indeed, there you go. You see? Now, just like that woman in John chapter 4, Jesus says, I got some water that if you drink it, you will never have to come back to this well. And that woman said, well, I tell you what, I want that water. Because she misunderstood what he was saying. He was using a metaphor for her accepting him as her personal savior. You see? So now that's the proper interpretation of John chapter 6. Now, of course, if Raymond quotes that again, I'm not going to put him out of the church. <laughs> I'm not going to put him out of the church. But, but I needed you to understand what the real interpretation is. And when you talk about communion, you're talking 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 23. That's the communion verse. This verse is talking about, is a metaphor for accepting Jesus Christ at his word. Now, I hope we understand that. Me, I mean, me, we are all right. This is just, we, we, we all right. This, that's a, yeah, we all right. It's, because we've been doing that for 20 some years. I've said nothing to him about it because it's not something that that's not blaspheming against the Holy Spirit because the reference is to the Lord's Supper. His reference was to the Lord's Supper. Nothing wrong with that. Except the fact that's not the interpretation of that verse. And so and what we have to do, uh, sometimes we have to admit that we do. And then I do the same thing. Sometimes I might quote a scripture. H have you ever heard the scripture uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 through 9, where it says, Eyes have not seen. Ears have not heard. I just quote that all the time. And, and, and nor has it entered into the hearts of men the things that the Lord has prepared for them to love him. I call that heaven. But that ain't heaven. That's not what that scripture is saying. But I quote it because it sounds so good. I mean, it, it just sounds like it ought to be. I mean, if it ain't, it sounds like it ought to be. 
eyes ain't never seen it, ears ain't never heard it. And, and, and so I said, well, hey, that, that's got to be heaven. And we are preachers now, still quoting that. So eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, my eyes have not heard, into the heart of them, the things that the Lord had prepared for them that love him. So you ain't never seen what heaven looks like. You have no idea what heaven looks like. Well, this sounds pretty good. And it fits. But that's not what that verse is saying. That verse is talking about the eternal purpose of God. You see, this is what it's talking about. And in Romans chapter 8, at verse 26, 27, 28, where the Bible says all things work together for good. To them that love the Lord. He's not talking about hard times. That's not what they're talking about. That's not what they're talking about at all. That ain't what Paul's talking about at all. He's talking about the eternal purpose of God. When he says all things work together for good to them that love the Lord who are the call according to his purpose. He's talking about the eternal purpose of God. He ain't talking about that all, that all things work together for good and, and they just keep on working and it's going to work out. Uh, that's not your verse for that. Now, it sounds good, but that's not your verse. That verse is talking about the eternal purpose of God, which means that sometimes, including me, including me, not, not just brother, sometimes I, I, until I study. Now, once I study, I find out that I have to back up. Because I had to back up in Romans chapter 8 because when I'm telling, when I used to tell members about if you're going through hard times, don't worry about it because all things work together for good. And I tell them that you just keep working and all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. If you love the Lord, then something good going to come to you. Well, that sounds pretty good. And it fits. But that ain't what he's talking about. <laughs> that what they're talking about, but it sounds good. But it doesn't do detriment. See, in other words, it, it doesn't do detriment. And, and, and even if even if I died believing that all things work together for good, then all things don't work together for good if you keep working at it. But that ain't what that verse is talking about. You see? So that's why Paul said, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we have to study. And, 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 and you can never know everything. You have to keep studying. Because sometimes we think a verse says something and it doesn't say what we think it says. But that's okay. That's okay about that. If you have, if you have, a, if you have a, a clean heart and if you have a pure heart, and, and, and if you have no government in your mind and you ain't trying to fool nobody, that's okay. That's okay because ain't no way in the world you're going to understand all the Bible anyway. There's no way anybody's going to understand all the Bible. Which means that there are going to be some verses you quote is going to be out of context. Because you can't understand the whole Bible by yourself. And, and I understand that and not only that, but there's nobody on the earth understand everything in the Bible. But the more you study and the more you read, the more light comes to you. And, 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 and you see, the more revelation you have, the more you have to make changes when you get revelations. You see, um, when, when you read the Bible, you listen exactly what the Bible said. Because when I read Romans chapter 8, and when I read the, the immediate context, and, and when, I read the, when I read the text and then the context, the immediate context and the remote context, I found out what that verse really meant. You see? And now, when I quote that verse, I make sure that I tell the folk what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm I say, now this verse does not, not apply to what I'm about to say. But I tell you what, it's a good verse for you to understand. And that is, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. In other words, if you stay with it, God will supply all your needs. You see? So that's what, and, 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 I, and I got off, but I just wanted, I wanted to mention that. And, and I didn't want to say that. I wanted to say that to the church, but I certainly um, wanted to say it in a way that I didn't want to, I didn't want my buddy Raymond to think I'm just hitting at him because that's not what I'm doing. You know, I, I want to be sure everybody understands that because I, would, I wouldn't stand here and do that. But I knew that he uh, does that on Sunday morning. And I never said anything to him because it never became, it's never a problem. It's never a problem. He's been, if I thought that was going to send him to the devil, I would have told him 25 years ago. You see? But he quotes it just like David, uh, praise the name of Jesus. Raymond knows that verse. As a matter of fact, he knows all them verses. And, and there's nothing wrong with that at all, uh, except the fact, now he knows, now you know, that it's not a communion verse, but it fits the occasion. 
but now you know what the proper interpretation of that verse is. Now, uh, the Bible says that we were, we were over in, 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 in John and um, uh, uh, John chapter 6, yeah, John chapter 6, but we, we're through with that. Let, let's go back to Exodus chapter 12. Let me hit that a couple of licks and then we'll be ready to go home. Now, uh, in, in verse 13, the Bible says in, in, in Exodus chapter 12, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now, go to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16, let me just do a little thing with Leviticus 16, and then we'll be, uh, we should not be ready to go. In the 16th chapter of the book of Leviticus, talking about uh, Jesus Christ as the Passover lamb. Uh, we, we, in verse 3, uh, in verse 3, uh, verse 2, and the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Abram thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy places within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the That God has said, look, you tell it, God told Moses, you tell Aaron that he can't come in here all the time. You, you don't come in here all the time. You only come in here once, once a year. That's the day of, day of atonement. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullet for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering and he shall put on the holy linen coat. Now if you want to find out where I got that from, uh, what I was referring to when I said the high priest had to take off his clothes and put on divine clothes, there it is in the 16th chapter. You can go ahead and mark that. That's verse, uh, that's verse 4 and 5. And then in verse number 6, uh, that's the day of atonement. There it is right there. Make an atonement for, made an atonement for himself. In verse, in verse number 6. And then verse number 9. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord Lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. That is, offering the sin offering for the people. That is, the high priest having to go into the most holy place and offer uh, uh, the, the sacrifice uh, for all of the people. Now, if you read the 16th chapter of the book of Leviticus, you will get that idea of the purpose uh, of the sacrifice and the purpose of the tabernacle. Now, if you go with me quickly to the 8th chapter of the book of Hebrews, of the 8th chapter of the book of Hebrews, let's start in the 7th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Let me read a couple of verses to you and show you the importance of the Son of God, show you the importance of Jesus Christ's priesthood. Now, understand that Jesus Christ was a different priest than the rest of the earthly priests. He was not the same as they were. The Bible says in verse 11 of the 7th chapter of the book of Hebrews, if therefore perfection were by the Leviticus priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What further need was there? For another priest should arrive after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron. Now Jesus was a high priest, but he was not the same high priest as the Jews knew. He was a different kind of high priest. And because, Paul said, because the priesthood changed, there was also a change in the law. There had to be a change in the law because there was a change in the priesthood. But then again, watch this. The Bible says in verse 12, for the priesthood being changed, there was made of necessity a change also of the law. That's why we are not under the law of Moses, because we don't have the same priesthood. When the priesthood changed, the law had to change. All right, now, for he of whom these things are spoken pertaining to another tribe of which no man gave attention, attention at the altar. Now here comes the kicker. Verse 14, for it is evident that our Lord Jesus sprang out of Judah. Every priest, every priest in the Old Testament came out of the Levitical priesthood, came out of the tribe of Levi. Every priest came out of the tribe of Levi. But here comes a priest that came out of the tribe of Judah. And his name is Jesus. The Bible says, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. In other words, Jesus is our high priest, but he is not the same as the earthly high priest because he didn't come from the same tribe. He came from a different tribe altogether. Genesis 39 and 10, the skeptic shall not depart from Judah, now the Lord given from between his feet until Shiloh come. And then we go quickly to the 8th chapter of the book of Hebrews. When you get to the 8th chapter of the book of Hebrews, the Bible is quite clear in verse 1. Now of these things which we have spoken, this is the song. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Now here's the point. If you understand the earthly tabernacle, then you can understand the heavenly tabernacle. Because you see, in the earthly tabernacle, the high priest went in 
once a year to the mercy seat to pray for the sins of the people. And he sprinkled the blood on the altar, on the mercy seat. That's the way it is in heaven. When Jesus died, he went back to his father. He went into, and, and, and it's right here, it's right here, in Hebrews, in, in Hebrews uh, chapter number nine. Watch Hebrews chapter uh, number nine. Uh, chapter number nine, I believe, yeah. Chapter number nine. I want to show you that. Chapter number nine. Um, uh, verse number seven. But I entered the second with the high priest alone once every year, not without blood. You, you can't, the high priest could not get into the tabernacle without the blood. So when Jesus went back to glory, when Jesus went back to his father, he went back with the blood. Now that doesn't mean he carried a cup of blood back to glory. That doesn't mean that at all. But he went back having given his blood for the sins of the world. And that's the only way that we could be reconciled to God. That is, Jesus had to shed his blood. And when he went back to glory, he went into the presence of the Lord. He went into the majesty of the Lord. He went to where the mercy seat was. He took his seat on the right hand of God. And he is there mediating for us every day. Just like the high priest went into the most holy place once a year on the day of atonement to pray for the people that God would roll their sin forward for a year. Jesus now goes back to glory into the majesty of God at the mercy seat sitting on the right hand of God that high priest went in once a year to pray that the sins of the people be rolled forward for a year but our high priest he pleads for us every day you see he pleads for us every day. But God doesn't recognize even his plea without the blood. It's the shedding of blood that causes God to accept reconciliation between himself and man. If it were not for the blood, there would be... See, when Jesus came back, he had shed in his blood. In other words, he paid the price and the price was the giving, his dying, and the giving of his blood. God, here, I'm with you. God had to have a perfect lamb. And the blood had to come from the perfect lamb. And the high priest had to take the blood from the perfect lamb, take it into the most holy place, sprinkle it on the altar. That's the only way God would forgive those Jews. He had to see the blood, but the blood had to come from a perfect animal. If the blood wasn't perfect, there would be no forgiveness. So when Jesus shed his blood, he was the lamb without blemish. He lived the life of a natural man and sinned not. Only man on earth that sinned not. He was perfect. And so when he shed his blood, the blood was coming from a perfect Lamb. And, and that's what God required. You see, God required a payment for Adam's sin. And, the, and somebody had to die because of Adam's sin. But the person who died had to be perfect in order to reconcile man back to God. And he tried. He tried Adam. He tried Moses. He tried David. He tried Isaiah. He tried, he tried them all. But none of them could
could stand the test of the devil until Jesus came. Now he's got the perfect lamb. All he needs now is the blood. And so when that, when that soldier pushed him in the side and the blood came out, that was the payment for the sin of Adam. And when Jesus got back to glory, God had seen the blood that came from the perfect lamb. And now God can forgive us of our sins. You see? And so it is a beautiful, beautiful picture when we know. You see, we are under, we are under a better covenant because the Jews had their sin rolled forward for a year. But we got a different high priest. Our high priest forgives us every day. Sometime, seven times a day. Sometimes seven times seven. You see? That means that Jesus is a different high priest than the earthly high priest. And the tabernacle in glory is a heavenly tabernacle. It was not made by the hands of men, but it was made by God himself. And so all we got to do now is to live so that we can be recipients of what comes from the blood of Jesus. What a powerful, powerful thing that is to know that Jesus is our high priest. Not only is he our high priest, but he knows what you're going through. You're not going through anything that he hasn't gone through. And so when you pray in his name, he knows what you're going through. He can tell the father, I know what she's trying to say. Because he's been there before. You see? And, and, and not only that, but he loves us so well, he would just keep forgiving us. And not only that, not only will he keep forgiving us, but in the end, he'll give us heaven itself. All we got to do is at least be honest and sincere about the goodness and the graciousness of God. Now, that, that's what that's about. That's just simply about knowing the heavenly tabernacle and how we can be a part of this great heavenly tabernacle as we reconcile ourselves to God. So, it was not just Jesus dying, but it was the blood. It was the blood. There is power in the blood. And the only way the devil is going to be defeated is by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so when you leave here tonight, you want to be sure you are covered by the blood of Jesus. Because there is power in the blood of Jesus. If you're here tonight, you want to say yes to the Lord, do it right now. If you're here and you want, to, you want the church to pray for you, do it now. If you're here and you're not a child of God, I want you to come to Jesus right now. While together we stand and while we sing the invitation song, come and be given the power of the better Jesus.